I felt like I was screaming from the top of the mountains and no one could hear me. I want to die is pretty much what I was saying to her. I was starting to think that it was more of a psychological problem with her. That just hit us like a bomb had dropped on us. I see my mom, I see my brother, and I see my kids. She would go to every single branch of science available to try to figure out what was wrong with her, and she could never find anything. Tonight, three medical mysteries and the doctors that solved them. Judy Goltz was suffering from a life-threatening illness. She knew she was sick, but the experts couldn't find anything wrong with her. I was so desperate. I even had him test me for AIDS. I was reaching, grasping for straws. Doctors thought they knew what was causing the unbearable pain in Terry Moore's body, but they were wrong. I remember one time crying, saying, you know, I just, I can't take it. It just hurts too bad. And Samantha Edgar, a child whose only hope was a mother who wouldn't give up. I would be ding-danged if uh, I was going to let her die, and I didn't, you know, die right along with her trying. When illness strikes, we look to doctors to give us answers. But what if they can't? For these unlucky patients, diagnosis is a mystery. Meet Samantha Edgar. When these pictures were taken, she was cute, energetic, a typical three-year-old child. But one week later, this is what Samantha looked like, and no one knew why. It all started in 1998, when Samantha's mother, Jackie Edgar, discovered she was pregnant with her third child. At first, Jackie was thrilled but the happiness soon wore off. In the pregnancy, I always said to Bill, I, I feel like there's something wrong. I feel kind of like there's a little dark cloud over my head or, I, and I really didn't have any reason to feel that way. I had two great little girls. We had a brand new house. We were doing fine. Everything was good, but I felt kind of, kind of doomed with, with the pregnancy. It was strange. In March, 1999, Jackie went into labor, five weeks before her due date. When Samantha was born, she was healthy but small and was admitted to the neonatal intensive care unit. My thoughts were, oh, well, OK, so this is just kind of, we're going to check off the boxes. She's going to be all right, and she's going to go home. I think it was about day three, her pediatrician uh, called me and said, we've noticed that Sam has had high blood pressure, which is unheard of nearly in newborns. And then I started noticing when I went into the NICU to um, nurse her that her face was getting bigger or had gotten a lot bigger. She was real jowly, like a, like a chipmunk. The nurses kept saying, oh, look at those chubby cheeks. I just love those cheeks. I want to grab those cheeks. And I'm thinking, that is not normal. There's something wrong with these cheeks. She got to the point where she couldn't nurse. She couldn't latch onto the breast. So I was pumping milk, and then I would have to sit her up and hold her cheeks up and feed her with a bottle because her cheeks were so immense. She was only eating about an ounce of breast milk an hour. And she was real kind of floppy when you would hold her. It was, uh, I don't want to say creepy, but it was a little bit creepy for me holding her because she didn't seem right. After 18 days of testing, doctors couldn't find a reason for the high blood pressure. Samantha was moved to Seattle Children's Hospital, where only the most serious cases are sent. We saw about 50 doctors, residents, interns in the first couple hours that we were there because they don't see a lot of babies with, with high blood pressure. So they did every test under the sun. Two weeks passed, and the doctors were still stumped. Whatever was causing Sam's bizarre symptoms was a complete mystery. She was given blood pressure medication and sent home. The doctors were saying things that ran a whole, across a whole range of possible diagnoses. The one that I thought made the most sense at the time was that she was simply born too early, and by the time she actually reaches her due date, her original due date, that some of this would resolve. We weren't getting any answers as to why our baby was so sick. It was a terrible feeling. It really was. It was a terrible feeling. 
I'm thinking she was about five or six weeks old, and she really didn't seem to be getting any better. I said, she's just so non-responsive. She's just like, she's like carrying a dead baby around. I mean, it's just dead weight. It's, it's not right. But within a few weeks, Sam started to get better. Her cheeks lost their puffiness, and Jackie and Bill tried weaning her off the blood pressure medications, which they thought might have been causing some of the listlessness. And lo and behold, her blood pressure numbers didn't go up at all. In fact, they continued to go down until she reached a normal level. And it was like a light went on with this baby. There was a remarkable change in her appearance where she started to look like a baby, and she actually started looking like a cute baby. She was gaining weight um, slowly. She was growing um, slowly, uh, but she was good. We thought, we thought everything was okay. For the next 20 months, Samantha seemed like a perfectly healthy child. Then, practically overnight, she started to change. It started with this this ferocious appetite. She would um, ask me for, she didn't talk very much then, but she would ask me for num num, num 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 num, and this was a child who never really ate. She would just shovel food into her mouth, and then she would complain that she was hungry again. She started getting up at night, and she would get up every hour, and she'd be soaked. Um, she had urine from, you know, her neck down to her toes, front and back. And it was about then that I noticed the swelling coming back in the face and the redness and then a little acne on her forehead and her eyebrows started growing together. She gained over 10 pounds in uh, maybe a little over a week and wasn't our little girl anymore. She would look in the mirror and she'd say, who's that? It was, it was kind of sad because she didn't recognize herself. A lot of people were thinking, oh, you know, this, she, she just grows, you know, she's really going through a growth spurt. And I remember thinking at that time, this isn't a growth spurt. Well, I took my children to Las Vegas and we were gone about 10 days. Samantha was perfectly normal and fine when I left. When I came back, I pulled up to Jackie's and Samantha came running out to the porch to meet me and there she was in this little dress. She had tights on just stuffed into the tights like little sausages. And I remember Jackie had a, a t-shirt on from the Taco Bell and it had the little Chihuahua dog and there was a taco next to it and Sammy kept going yum, 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 trying to eat the taco. Tina walked up the steps and she said, what happened to her? She looks, she looks sick again. She looks like she did when she was a newborn. So I thought, this is the same thing. It's, it's come back. Jackie's pediatrician suspected that Sam's symptoms were being caused by a hormonal imbalance. So he referred Samantha to an endocrinologist. But they had to wait five weeks for an appointment. And Sam, now two years old, was getting worse. She was in a lot of pain. She'd say, my back hurts, my back hurts, my feet hurt, my head hurts, you know. When Samantha eventually saw an endocrinologist, he tested her for a rare genetic disorder that causes chronic hunger. The results wouldn't be ready for over a month. In the meantime, Jackie was sent to a nutritionist. So the nutritionist said, um, she said that we needed to decrease her salt intake, decrease her snack foods, give her rye crisp if she wants, you know, fishy crackers, that kind of thing. And I, I'm afraid I wasn't very nice to her. I, um, I actually at one point said, you know, this isn't about Cheetos. She's sick. She's sick, and they don't know what it is. They didn't understand that. I think they saw Jackie as um, an aggressive, almost bitchy mom with this fat kid who had a fat kid and was wondering why her kid was fat. Five weeks later, the tests came back negative. Whatever Sam had, it was not a genetic disorder. And at that point, for about a week prior to the test coming back, Sam just stopped eating. And she started sleeping through the night. Her appetite diminished, her, her face started to get a little bit thinner. She, she slowly dropped the weight. She went back to exactly how she was before. And I was still just hoping that this was some bizarre thing that happened and, and maybe we were done with this whole mess. 
but I always had in the back of my head that there was something in her, something just waiting, lying in wait. Nine months later, Samantha's illness struck again. Jackie would call me on the cell phone. She wet the bed last night. She's starting to eat a whole lot. As Sam's condition deteriorated, Jackie was told she'd have to wait to see another endocrinologist. I said, you need to take her down there. There's something wrong with her. You need to park yourself down there and do not leave. I said, you're going to have to play the crazy card. I think we were there for about three and a half or four hours. And then they paged us to see him. They pretty much said, you know, you know, you, we've seen this before. You, we've been here. Yeah, we know that she gets these little things, but I don't think it's anything. I did, I guess, understand right then that he, that he wasn't going to be able to help me. I remember the look in her face, and she was, you know, saying, nobody's doing anything. He just thinks she's just a fat, greasy kid. He thinks I'm nuts and hysterical, and I don't know what to do. I felt like I was screaming from the, the top of the mountains and no one could hear me. And then I started doubting my own sanity, thinking, oh, is, am I making a mountain out of a molehill? Is this the way my child grows? You know, does she eat and eat and eat? But I knew, I knew in my heart, there's something wrong. For Jackie Edgar, the joy of raising her daughter Samantha has been marred by the fear and uncertainty caused by a mysterious disease Samantha has had since she was born. In 2001, the three-year-old seemed to be getting better, but then it started all over again. I got a call from the resident in the emergency room who said he had a patient three-year-old girl had been referred in by her primary care physician for glucose in the urine, which is usually associated with diabetes. But he went on to say that the story is more complicated. So I decided to go down to the ER uh, and check it out. I saw um, a, a man in a white coat come walking down the hall, kind of striding down the hall, I remember. And I said, well, look at him, Bill. Can you, you, what do you bet he's an endocrinologist? <laughs> in fact, I think she used the word a dumbass endocrinologist. And that was sort of her attitude at our first meeting. <laughs> uh, Jackie, I think, already had made the assumption that this was going to be another endocrinologist that was going to come in and send us down, you know, a, a whole range of tests, poke holes in our daughter again to no, you know, successful diagnosis. I was ready to go to battle with him. And he just nodded. He just nodded. He said, I'm sorry you've had such a hard time with this. This is a puzzle. This is such a mystery. And it's a fascinating case. And he was just really, he was exactly what I needed. So I just started talking to him a mile a minute. And he actually sat down and uh, looked at her pictures and looked at her. She was a little overweight, but she was not morbidly obese. She had, she had a look that reminded me of Cushing syndrome. Cushing syndrome is a potentially deadly malfunctioning of the adrenal glands. These glands make hormones that are vital for development and managing stress. But Cushing's causes them to produce too much of the hormone cortisol, leading to weight gain, excessive hair growth, hypertension, bone loss, and muscle damage. And I told her, Right then and there, I wanted to get an ultrasound of her adrenals and see if we could find a tumor. So we did that, and that was negative. And then I told her the main thing we wanted to do was a 24-hour cortisol level, which is sort of the definitive test for Cushing syndrome. Oh, Jackie was so relieved. She found her hero. He was, he cared. I remember her coming home from her appointment and saying, somebody cares, he actually cares. A week later, Jackie and Sam were back at Dr. Gunther's office to see how the cortisol level test had come out. The results were frightening. The cortisol level was in the neighborhood of 3,000 nanograms per 24 hours. To put that in perspective, normal is less than about 15. So this was close to 500 times the normal amount of cortisol. So at that point, I knew what, but I didn't know how and I didn't know why. 
The elevated levels of cortisol proved that Sam had Cushing's syndrome, but the puzzle was far from complete. Cushing's is extremely rare, and no one had ever heard of it occurring in someone as young as Samantha. Dr. Gunther admitted Sam to the hospital to find out why she was producing these astronomical levels of cortisol. But privately, Gunther told Jackie there was another reason for admitting Sam. He said to me that he had spoken to some colleagues and he had spoken to some people and that he was concerned because there was mention around Children's Hospital of Munchausen by proxy. Munchausen by proxy is simply when a caregiver, usually the mother, is deliberately making the child sick, usually for the attention, presumably, that she garners from the attention that's lavished on her daughter or on her son. I was so startled. I said, Munchausen, I said, what? I, who would do that? I wasn't really getting it until I finally went to my sister and Val, and they said, well, they think that you're doing it. They think that you're making Sam sick. You've got to remember, what we're seeing here is a picture, apparently, of a girl who's being exposed to high doses of hydrocortisone for very brief periods of time, separated by periods of greater than a year, 10 months, six months. I said, you know, you're crazy. You're, uh, you're the one that's crazy, you know? Why would you think that? He said, well, I don't think you have Munchausen. She just did not fit the bill of Munchausen at all. These, and they're almost always women, are usually very ingratiating with the medical establishment. You can say a lot of things about Mrs. Edgar and her relationship with the medical establishment, but ingratiating would not be one of the descriptions. <laughs> Dr. Gunther knew that Sam was being exposed to too much cortisol, but now he had to prove that it was Samantha's own body and not her mother that was causing it. I told her we need to do some tests in a supervised environment because we have to take this off the table. Otherwise, it's always going to be in the room. After four days of testing, Gunther got the results he had hoped for. It was Samantha's own body and not her mother that was inducing the high levels of cortisol. The Munchausen by proxy suspicion was dropped. But Gunther was still no closer to solving the mystery. So the outcome was that this was real. It was Cushing syndrome and that it appeared to be cyclical. It appeared to be coming and going like the flu and I had no explanation for how or why that could be happening. After two years of searching, Jackie Edgar has discovered that her daughter Samantha is suffering from a rare and potentially deadly illness, Cushing's disease. Now, Jackie and her doctor, Dan Gunther, need to find out how to cure it. So I hit the books and uh, did quite a bit of research. Acting more like a detective than a doctor, Gunther discovered a physician at the National Institutes of Health who was studying Cushing syndrome. And so we bundled her off eventually uh, to Maryland, uh, to the NIH. After 10 days of testing, Gunther's determination paid off. The doctors found that Samantha's adrenal glands were covered with microscopic nodules that were causing them to overproduce cortisol. The only hope for a cure was to remove the glands. Fortunately, if you remove the adrenal glands, we can replace all of these hormones. And as long as they're replaced, you pretty much can function perfectly well without your adrenal glands. On April 8th, she had the surgery. It, I'm thinking it was about four or five hours, and it was really virtually the fastest four or five hours of my life. I sat there and I read a magazine and I drank coffee and I think it went like that. But a couple of days and she was up and talking and reading and watching television. That was such a joyful moment for us because it was like, okay, you know, she's really gonna be fine. She's tough. She made it through. Sam's wonderful. Sam's like a whole new new girl. It's been almost a year and a half since surgery, and it's like we got a new kid a, a year and a half ago. A single operation has transformed Samantha's life. 
But the operation might never have happened if it weren't for Jackie's persistence and Dr. Gunther's determination. It's the same in medicine as anything else. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. Mrs. Edgar is a ferocious advocate for her child. And there's no doubt that helped Sam's cause. And if someone doesn't give you an answer, they'll see someone else and go and go and go and knock on doors and sit in waiting rooms and, and, and find out till you're satisfied, till finally you're at peace with yourself and, and you've known that you've done all you could. Sam was cured when she was still very young. She has a whole healthy life ahead of her. But imagine a different scenario. You're a college student, a basketball player. Then one day, you are told you have a crippling, incurable disease. It happened to Terry Moore. In 1998, I was a junior in college at James Madison University, uh, playing a lot of basketball, played every day, pretty much. And I come home for spring break, and I wake up, it was Monday or Tuesday morning, and my knee was completely swollen and hot to the touch. And I tried to go to bed that night, and I, it hurt so bad, I couldn't leave it flat on a bed. So I slept on the couch. It was so much pain that I couldn't um, have the fan, the ceiling fan on. I could sense the breeze when our pet walked by. Just in my, just horrible. Fluid drained from Terry's knee indicated that he might have gout, inflammation of the joints caused by a buildup of uric acid in the body. But the rheumatologist he was referred to disputed the diagnosis, and with good reason, according to Terry's internist, Dr. Fred Tewheel. Uh, he did not have the kind of classic gout presentation that we see in internal medicine. Typical gout attack in an internal medicine is a man in his 40s, usually overweight, um, who uh, has a family history of gout, who comes in with an acutely swollen joint, um, usually a, a toe joint. The rheumatologist told Terry it looked like he had a form of inflammatory arthritis, but arthritis can be difficult to diagnose. Unfortunately, with a lot of the inflammatory arthritis, there isn't a, a lot of times one test or one thing you can say, oh, that's what it is. Uh, frequently, it's a syndrome, it's a, it's a combination of symptoms. Terry started taking anti-inflammatory medication. Didn't really tell a whole lot of people. Was always embarrassed about why I was limping around. You know, I'm 22 and I have arthritis. That's not fun to say, say to your friends. When we first met, he, Terry was hobbling around a lot. And of course, you ask what's wrong or what's going on. Pretty much, I think I told her I just had a sports injury. I thought, here's this outgoing, really nice, super nice guy who's athletic that just happened to hurt his knee and didn't really think that much of it. But after, I think after being with her for a little while, she kind of figured there's something else going on. Over the course of his senior year in college, the anti-inflammatories stopped working and Terry's pain got worse. There were times at school he'd call and he, he just couldn't walk. The pain was so bad in the knee or in the foot that he would use crutches to get around with. It was really hard to watch him go through all the flare-ups and then the flare-up to go away and then come back maybe a week, maybe two weeks later. It was this constant roller coaster of what are we going to be able to do and what aren't we going to be able to do. Graduated in 99, and same things are still happening. Terry had been under treatment for two years, but the pain was still crippling. His rheumatologist tried a more aggressive approach, putting him on two new drugs, prednisone, a steroid, and methotrexate, a drug used in chemotherapy. The methotrexate um, is kind of made me you know, sick to my stomach. It pretty much, as soon as he took it, would be so horribly nauseous that he would just want to go to sleep. And with the prednisone kind of makes you gain weight, and I started feeling fatter and um, Started, my hair actually just started thinning out a little bit. Now I'm 23, 24, and starting to look chubby and losing my hair. So it didn't feel great. Even with the new powerful drugs, Terry's flare-ups got more frequent, each one more painful than the last. I stopped sports altogether at that point. It was almost like he was a totally different person. On a daily basis, you didn't really think about it, but when you took a a step back, he went, oh, we're not doing anything that we used to do. 
Terry's doctor told him that he probably had rheumatoid arthritis, a very severe and debilitating form of the disease. With rheumatoid arthritis, the body's natural immune system goes haywire and attacks healthy joint tissue. It can cause permanent damage to bone and cartilage. Joints can become deformed and lose all range of motion. That just hit us like a, a bomb had dropped on us. Um, we knew how debilitating rheumatoid arthritis could be. I mean, Kim and I had conversations about what's, what's my future going to be? Is she going to be pushing me in a wheelchair when I'm, when I'm 35 or 40? I never pictured a life not with Terry, and I never pictured us being apart, and I knew we would be together forever, but like, I didn't know how the day-to-day -day would be. She just stood by him and was always there for him. And I think in his mind that, you know, do I really want to have her go through this not knowing what the outcome's going to be? The crippling pain also started taking a toll on Terry's mental health. In April 2002, after suffering with the disease for four years, Terry was desperate. He went to Dr. Tawil for help. And I told him, you know, I, I was, I'm coming to you because I, I have rheumatoid arthritis and I'm just... I'm not getting much better. I'm actually kind of feeling worse, um, but I'm getting depressed. You know, I'm always in a bad mood, feeling down. He was uh, facing a lifelong chronic disease that was going to cause him lifelong misery, uh, at least to a certain extent, uh, which would require medications that uh, were certainly not benign, uh, which would cause potential side effects in future health issues. Dr. Tawil prescribed antidepressants. Terry's mood got better but his joint pain continued to get worse. February 3rd of that year, of 2003, my elbow was inflamed. I wasn't feeling well. I took my temperature and I had like, it was like a 101, 102. Throwing, started throwing up. Um, thought I had the flu. And it was just intensified by having a, a flare up in my elbow. Terry called his rheumatologist the next day. He suspected it was an infection and prescribed antibiotics. But by the following morning, Terry could barely move his arm. I walked into Kim and I said, I, I, I can't take it. And he started crying and he started saying, I, I want to die. I cannot live like this. And he was resolved to the fact that he would rather die than have this pain ever again, let alone for the rest of his life. By 2003, Terry Moore's life had become a living hell. Five years earlier, he had been diagnosed with a crippling form of arthritis, and now his elbow was in such pain that he didn't want to go on. Desperate, he dragged himself to the emergency room. I remember walking in, and it was almost like, I'm here, to, you know, almost feel like I fell forward and just said, take me. The ER attending took one look at Terry's elbow and called an orthopedic surgeon. Given that he was not responding to the antibiotics, uh, I recommended to Terry that the plan of action would be to proceed with uh, um, operative treatment, go in and, and remove the inflamed tissue and see what we find. Uh, came into the operating room and cut through the uh, skin of the back of the elbow, and immediately there was fluid that came out. But to my surprise, there was no pus. Uh, pus being uh, the uh, uh, byproduct of an infection. And then I proceeded to excise uh, all of this material that was white, uh, thick cottage cheese in nature. The next day, Dr. Aguiar told Terry and Kim about the cottage cheesy material he had found, but explained that they would have to wait for the pathology report to come back to see what had caused it. In the meantime, Kim did some research of her own. I started doing some searches on the internet for things like rheumatoid arthritis and cottage cheese. And that's when all these articles started coming up about gout and the pictures were horrific. And that's when I called Terry and he said, that's what they told me I had in the beginning. Kim's discovery was shocking. Could the source of Terry's misery be gout? The same disease he had been diagnosed with five years earlier? At Terry's follow-up visit, Kim asked Dr. Aguiar. I said, well, you're, you know, you're right, it's possible. When you have a patient with a swollen joint, 
uh, there's a, a huge list of possibilities that it could be. Rheumatoid arthritis, got arthritis, riders, psoriatic arthritis, infection can cause arthritis, the list goes on. Gout, in Terry's case, was not top of my list when I saw him in the hospital because it looked to me like infection. But when the pathology report came back from the lab, it showed that the material found in Terry's arm was full of uric acid crystals, a sure sign of gout, the same diagnosis that had been dismissed five years earlier. The discovery was staggering. Terry said, well, does that mean that I don't have rheumatoid arthritis? I said, well, uh, sometimes you can have both conditions, but to me, what's going on in your elbow is clearly gout, and he asked me, does that mean that that's what I've had in my other joints? And I said, it's very possible. A urine test confirmed that Terry's uric acid levels were sky high. In healthy people, uric acid is excreted by the kidneys. But in Terry's case, his body was producing too much uric acid for his kidneys to handle. It was flooding his body and causing his joints to swell. Gout symptoms can be similar to arthritis, but the reality is that for five long years, Terry had been treated for the wrong disease. When I heard it, I got very angry about it. It wasn't so much anger at any specific person. It was just an overall, what have we been doing for five years? Every time I went to see a doctor in the past, the previous four or five years, I had gone in saying, I have this syndrome or I have rheumatoid arthritis. And that's pretty much how I was treated. And I was guilty of uh, being caught up with his di diagnosis. He presented with a five-year history of uh, presumed rheumatoid arthritis. So I assumed he had rheumatoid arthritis. Young and otherwise healthy, Terry was not a typical gout patient. But as he's learned, it's important to look beyond the obvious. There's a lot about medicine that is not uh, logarithmic, and clearly it is an art. It's really incumbent upon us as patients to ask the right questions, to seek the right answers. The way I, I would look at treating or getting treated in the future is being aggressive myself and doing more research as far as what your symptoms may be. Terry went off the arthritis medication immediately and started taking drugs to cure his gout. It was just amazing the difference in his personality. Within a month, I was feeling better and by that May, I was playing basketball again, and I still have problems occasionally, but nowhere near the severity and nowhere near the length when they do occur. He went off the antidepressants and has been for, I'd want to say, over a year now. He was just such a happier person, physically, mentally, the whole deal. I think that's what gave him the uh, courage and all to ask Kim to marry him. The whole time, Kim was Kim was my support, and. Couldn't have gotten through any of it without her. Uh, I, don't, I don't foresee anything that we couldn't handle together. Terry had been misdiagnosed for five years. What he did have was treatable. For others, an accurate diagnosis can mean the difference between life and death. In uh, 1995, um, it was a very busy time. My brother was getting married. In addition, we were two weeks away from adopting my daughter. 41-year-old Judy Goltz is a mother of two and a registered nurse. I was feeling a little bit run down. Uh, it was October, and I kind of felt a little flu-like. And I woke up that morning, um, and I went to the bathroom, and I um, passed a burgundy-colored stool. My nursing instincts and training told me it was blood, but um, I, I wasn't really quite sure. Worried, Judy rushed to the emergency room. I went down and met her there. They had done several tests, blood tests, and they never really found anything. He said to me, I'm sure this is an infection. Here's an antibiotic. Come in next in a couple of days when the bleeding stops, and we'll do a colonoscopy. Five days later, a colonoscopy showed nothing. It appeared that if it was an infection, it had cleared up. Uh, the bleeding had stopped. So I, you know, I felt that, OK, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. It was a one-time episode. She's young, and she appears very healthy. You think, OK, it was just a, a polyp of some sort or a hemorrhoid. So we didn't pay too much attention. At least I didn't pay as much attention. But as the months went on, Judy began to feel worse and worse. I caught everything. I was probably sick every three months. 
with a cold, a flu, um, urinary tract infections, everything. I just was constantly ill. I started to put on weight. Over a period of five years, I put on almost 30 pounds. I thought it was just part of her getting a little bit older, taking care of the kids more than she's taking care of herself. One of the other things that I was experiencing at that time was um, what I call a, uh, a type of mental fog. I would just feel like uh, sometimes I was thinking through a haze. I thought she's a young mom. She's running, running, running. I thought maybe she was just tiring herself out. I knew something was wrong with me, and I was not going to give up until I found out what it was. So I, um, I went to an endocrinologist. Actually, I, I went to two over a period of five years. I went to a um, rheumatologist. I went to, I, I have a shopping list of doctors. I went to a um, cardiologist and a vascular doctor. She would go to every single branch of science available to try to figure out what was wrong with her. And, and she could never find anything. In December 1999, four years after the first episode, Judy hemorrhaged again. Same type of episode happened where I uh, was bleeding again. Tests revealed Judy's red blood cell count was dangerously low. They did a couple of procedures, um, had colonoscopy, upper endoscopy, um, gave me a lot of IVs. I was not allowed to eat or drink. They were resting my stomach. My doctor came in. Again, was not concerned. Said, maybe an infection again. You know, could be a polyp. Judy was told not to worry, but for the next two years, her health continued to deteriorate. She began to panic. I was so desperate. <laughs> I, I even had him test me for AIDS, you know, HIV. I, I just felt I was reaching, grasping for straws. I had been tested for lupus, for scleroderma. I had been tested for MS. I had been tested for all kinds of thyroid issues. Um, and everything had come back negative. I was starting to think that it was more of a psychological kind of problem with her. It was just one story after the other, one, one illness after the other. I just said, you know, enough, enough. You know, let's just stop this. And I was at the point where I was starting to believe maybe it is me. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe everybody feels this way. You know, maybe it's, maybe it's normal to feel this way. But in February 2001, five years after her first bleed, Judy experienced her most serious episode of bleeding yet. Her condition had become critical. This time, I knew I'm getting an answer. This is absolutely ridiculous. For five years, Judy Golds had been suffering from frightening bouts of bleeding. She had been told again and again that it was nothing to worry about. Then, she met Mount Sinai Hospital's Dr. Mark Reiner. If a patient, any patient, uh, has repeated problems and they're not receiving an adequate answer, then it's their right and in a certain way their duty to try to get the right answer. Dr. Reiner recommended exploratory surgery. He said, um, I'm going to open you up. I'm going to go through your intestines with a fine tooth comb. He said, we'll go piece by piece by piece. And he looked at it very confidently, and he said, if it is this big, I'll find it. At the hospital, Judy was prepped for surgery. As she lay in pre-op waiting, she had one request for Mike. She said, you have to promise me, whatever it is, you come down to the recovery room and tell me. She said, promise. So to me, I, I said, I promise you. I gave her a kiss and they wheeled her off and I just went back and waited in her room for her to, to come up. When I first put the laparoscope in, the first thing you do is look around and explore the abdomen visually before touching anything. Uh, I looked at her in the pelvis to look at her ovaries. These were completely normal, as was her uterus. I looked at the liver and gallbladder, which were normal, and I explored her colon, which was also completely normal. Dr. Reiner's last words to me were saying, Mike, listen, it's about a three-hour surgery. The longer I'm in there, that means I can't find anything. 
So I looked at my watch and said, wow, three and a half hours, he didn't find anything. I then decided to run the small bowel, which is where I thought the problem was. And 15 minutes later, Dr. Reiner comes in, and he uh, claps his hand, and he shakes his hands and says, hey, Mike, I found the cause of your wife's bleeds. Kind of nonchalant, and I said, oh, great, what was it? He goes, sit down. And, and I remember I got chills completely all over my body. I said, what? He said, I need you to sit down. And um, that's when he told me that, it, that he, had, uh, he had found a tumor, a malignant tumor, that had uh, gone into her lymph system. <laughs> The next thing I remember waking up was extreme pain and my husband just sobbing, just absolutely sobbing. He's apologizing. I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. You know, um, I should have listened to you. Mike told Judy what Dr. Reiner had found. My whole world just narrowed down to like this big and um, it was just horrible, just absolutely horrible. The next thing I remember is being transferred to the room. And that was hard because now I see my mom, I see my brother, and I see my kids. I'm sorry. The next day, Dr. Reiner came in to talk to Judy in person. And he said, um, well, the bad news is you have cancer. He said, but the good news is that it's carcinoid cancer. And it's a slow-growing cancer. Uh, I cut it out. You had it uh, in your small intestine. You had some metastasis to some lymph nodes. I yanked all those out. Judy had struggled for five years to find out what was wrong with her. And now she knew it was cancer. Though rare and slow growing, the type of cancer that Judy has is still very dangerous. If left unchecked, carcinoid tumors can spread throughout the body. Dr. Reiner had operated just in time. I felt, okay, you know, all right, at least I know what the enemy is. And, um, you know, I'm gonna see somebody and I'm gonna get a handle on this. With her tumor removed, Judy went home to recuperate. And I lost all 30 pounds within two weeks. <laughs> and although I was weak and not feeling well, I could tell that I was, I was, gonna, I was gonna get through this and, and be better. But Judy's gastroenterologist explained that she wasn't out of the woods yet. The road ahead would be filled with testing and waiting. When you're diagnosed with cancer, you think, okay, what do I have to do? You know, chemotherapy, radiation, you know, let's, let's do it. When you're diagnosed with carcinoid, Unless you actually have an active tumor where they can see it and they can deal with it, there's not a whole lot to do. It's like you have to sit back and wait for the tide to come in, you know, and that's really frustrating. There is a very good possibility that it is gone. It isn't going to come back. Um, Judy eats right, exercises, does everything humanly possible. I would say that her 10-year survival is probably in the 80% range. If she gets out to 10 years without disease, then her chances of going further than that become dramatically higher. By refusing to give up her quest for a diagnosis, Judy has greatly improved her odds for a healthy future. While doctors agree that the diagnostic process works most of the time, they also agree that medicine is not an exact science. What I often tell patients uh, when they come to me, it, that common things are common. Uh, I live in Manhattan. Right, and I tell them, if you hear hoofbeats in Central Park, it's probably a horse, not a zebra. So in patients such as Judith, her original doctors went and looked for what is common because almost assuredly in their mind, that's what they're dealing with. But Judy is determined to change that attitude. So I designed a pin, uh, the awareness pin. Uh, we went with black and white because not all hoofbeats are horses, that sometimes it's a zebra. And the doctors need to listen. Uh, and to look for the zebras. <laughs>